Hello. We'll just give it a few seconds until people get into the space. We're really pleased to welcome viewers back and welcoming our very special guest today. This, the Pandemic of Racism series is a series of critical conversations that Senator Stan Kutcher and I have been hosting for the past six weeks, where we are looking at uh, inspiring conversations related to racial injustice and the effect that it has on racialized people and how to create more courageous spaces for these difficult conversations to happen. It is time for us to reset our institutions to ensure that they are intersectional and representative of the Canadian population. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Wanda. And uh, it's a, a great pleasure for me to kick off the introductions with uh, my seatmate <laughs> in the chamber, which is uh, Senator Peter Vum. He's a career foreign service officer, was ambassador to Germany, 2008 to 2012, and uh, was the assistant deputy minister for the Americas, North American Consular Affairs. So he is uh, an extremely, extremely gifted and knowledgeable uh, person in this uh, wider area of Canada and international relations, and currently is the chair of the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Trade. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much. So, Senator Peter Beam is your seatmate. I will call Senator Kim Pate my soulmate. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Pate was appointed to the Senate of Canada on the same day that I was, November 10th, 2016. First and foremost, she describes herself as the mother of Michael and Madison. But she is a nationally renowned advocate who has spent the past 40 years working in and around the legal and penal systems of Canada with and on behalf of some of the most marginalized victimized, criminalized, and institutionalized, particularly imprisoned youth, men, and women around this country. And I had the privilege of serving with her on the, uh, the on Ritter, the Human Rights Committee. We're delighted that you are both able to be with us today. And today we're talking about white privilege and white fragility. And it's wonderful to have the two of you here with us to talk about these topics. First of all, you know, we'd like to ask the question, and maybe we'll start with you, Senator Pate. Are these terms interchangeable? Uh, well, I think those are terms that make white people feel better. What we really need to talk about is white supremacy. Uh, and so when we talk about white fragility or we uh, talk about white privilege, it's a way for white people to talk about how they have benefited without really naming that it is white supremacy that has put um, us in positions of privilege and power with more, greater access to those resources than people who are not white. And so um, I think it's really important to name it. And um, I guess I don't want to hog time, but uh, I, you know, I think Unless we name it, we don't actually fundamentally do much about it. We make ourselves feel better, but we don't necessarily change things. And what about you, Senator Beam? What's your perspective on the terms? And I, I, I tend to agree with Senator Pate on, uh, on, on this one. For me, white fragility, it's, it's not clear in definitional terms. I, I understand white supremacy, and that is a basic racist uh, ideology. I get white privilege. I'm a a product of white uh, white privilege, but for me, fragility just seems as a, a, another faddish uh, buzz term, or perhaps a, a placebo to help uh, those who are white who are reading about white privilege to uh, to believe that they too, in some way, are are victims. So I, I don't think it it uh, it really gets at uh, at the issue uh, to my way of uh, to my way of thinking and. Uh, 
thinking about uh, white fragility, and I know there's a book on this, and, uh, and and it was a bestseller. Okay, I mean people can read that, but that should not be their exclusive uh, approach. Nor do I think that that is the sort of book that should be used as a management manual, as I understand it is, uh, for people in management positions who are looking at the whole issue of uh, of systemic racism. I, I don't think it answers the question. Well, why is there such a reluctance in work around uh, addressing systemic racism, in addressing racism in all its forms? Why is there such a reluctance to deal with white supremacy? Why is there such comfort in leaning in to terms like white fragility and embracing terms like that? What's, what's going on there? Do you want me to start? Uh, well, I think it, it you know, as I said earlier, I think it makes us feel better. It makes us, and as uh, Senator Bema said, makes us feel like somehow we are part of the victimization. It was not our fault that the society is, has a white supremacist um, construct, history, continuation that allows systemic discrimination to continue. And I mean, I haven't read the book, so I should, I should fess up. Um, when I want to learn about uh, systemic racism, I generally read uh, authors who are black or indigenous who are describing the challenges of trying to address the systemic biases in that fashion. So the idea, even you know, even though um, it's it's written from the perspective of someone who has embraced some forms of systemic discrimination, um, it's not necessarily the go-to that I would, even though it's a bestseller. So. Uh, so I must confess, I haven't read White Fragility, and just the name itself didn't appeal to me, and quite the opposite. It actually repulsed my interest in, in reading it, if I can put it that way. And I think we really have to, you know, face, um, when, you, when you want to actually dismantle syst systemic discrimination, it means actually sharing power, sharing resources, making space, yielding in a way that is not very comfortable for people who have, you know, whose lifetime, whether it's because of white privilege or because of class privilege or whatever the privilege is, it's hard to yield that if you've become used to it because it means then that you are challenging your own position and where you're comfortable. And, and you know, I try to make myself uncomfortable in these conversations because it's in those moments of discomfort that action usually happens and usually progress and my thinking can expand. Um, so that, that's just my thought, not that that's the be all and end all. And now you guys can correct me. <laughs> I think if we look at, uh, at white supremacy, we have to realize that we are dealing with a phenomenon and, and an approach that has existed for centuries, uh, if not millennia. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are all kinds of uh, historical records that, uh, that show this. And so to come up with, uh, with new terms that, uh, that try to explain or to try to make us feel better or to approach it, uh, while laudable in terms of a name, I think it, uh, it misses the mark. And uh, let me just uh, illustrate that, if I can, with a, a very short um, vignette from my past life. I um, 20 years ago, I was our ambassador at the OAS in Washington. And there's a, a day every October 12th, which they call down there, Dia de la Raza, Day of the Race. Now, it's also called Columbus Day in, uh, in many countries uh, in this particular hemisphere. And mm -hmm. at that particular time, there were uh, speeches given by the representatives, the fellow ambassadors of countries of Latin America, uh, about what a great thing the colonization was and commemorating Columbus and the discovery, so to speak. And then the lights would go on as the Caribbean representatives would also want to speak. And they came at it in a very different way. So eventually there was a sort of saw off about the encounter of two cultures. But I made the point uh, then, and I, I learned a lot through this, that there's one culture missing, never mind the indigenous peoples, important as all of that is in terms of the encounter of cultures in the Americas and the colonizers, but what about the slaves who were brought from Africa? That's not that was not an encounter of uh, of cultures, and it is not something to celebrate. So, the illustration I'm making is just to say how deeply, deeply ingrained this thought is, and how white supremacy is deeply ingrained historically, 
in the education system and in fact that even holidays are celebrated in that context now that holiday has uh, has evolved uh, even in the past 20 years but there's so so much more work to do I, I i i would agree with with my colleagues and one thing that there's two things i just want to raise I'll follow along that line when is the invisibility of race when you're white you know <laughs> if you don't look back on yourself and say oh they're white <laughs> you never do that because you've grown up in a cultural framework a social framework where you've been socialized into that is the norm and 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 so when, when you say that's white supremacy it's like pogo's famous saying we have seen the enemy and the enemy is us and and that is a really really emotionally psychologically difficult step to make i've seen the enemy and i am the enemy but unless you actually make that step you can't come to solutions and and i and 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 kim was talking about the discomfort i i think you're spot on without substantive discomfort we don't make changes because as long as we're feeling happy well why should we bother doing anything that's different it's only when we see the tremendous when we are forced to actually experience the discomfort that we that we can actually move forward i think that that's really important thank you for raising that issue I, I would absolutely agree with that. And, uh, you know, I, I think about how much energy people like me take up trying to, in, in doing this work, uh, we take up so much of our energy is taken up trying to help white people feel better, uh, even when we know they're making mistakes. We know a mistake has been made and we take such care. We have to take such care in terms of how we address that so that we don't come across. Well, let me speak about myself. I don't want to come across as the quote, unquote, angry black woman, which you know is a label that I know has been thrown at me many, many times. And, and part of that label comes from raising issues that make white people, raising issues around race and racism that make white folks uncomfortable. So not everyone's at that place where they say, where you are, Kim, and saying, you know, the, the discomfort is good because it pushes me to action. Hmm. For me, I'm, I'm often in a space where I'm saying, okay, this put me in a point of rage and the <laughs> rage can lead me to action, but Every time I know I feel that point of rage, I know I'm ad I'm adding years to my life, or taking years off my life rather. I'm mm -hmm. taking years off my life. So how do we push people? How do we get people to see the importance of talking about white supremacy, about having mm -hmm. those co those uncomfortable conversations, and how do we create what I call a braver space for people to be able to do that and and take the pressure off folks like me who are trying to open up these conversations a little bit more. Well, I'm still learning um, and every day I'm, I hope I learn a little bit more. So I don't have the answers, but I, I do know that one of the three things we do have to do is not expect to, I mean, I just had this conversation two days ago. Someone called me up and said, you know, I'd like to make sure that we have um, some Indigenous representation in this particular. And I said, okay. And I, I said, but you haven't made your space welcoming. You're, what you're doing is asking someone to come and give free labor to advise you on how not to be racist in this <laughs> context. Uh, no, are you paying a fee? Are you, you know, have you read anything? Have you thought about the structure of your organization? Have you thought, and that was all novel, new to them. And so, you know, in my most charitable moment, I think, okay, part of my job is to, where I have some experience in this to maybe help translate that experience, but um, to also push people to do their own work because the amount of work that's expected of uh, others to to train and untrain, um, you know, white people. I think that's what that what what I imagine the White Fragility book does. You know, now I'm going to have to read it because now I, <laughs> I can properly deconstruct. But um, 
you know, I don't actually don't want to spend my time on that. I wanted, uh, you know, but part of the ways that I have, um, you know, that I keep trying to learn is to open up to, okay, I don't understand this. I'm going to try and understand it first as best I can. Then I'm going to try and figure out, is there a way to, to broach it? So for instance, in the area that I work mostly in prisons, I thought it was really important to make space for the organizations who had an interest in why so many Indigenous and Black prisoners in particular were having, why the numbers are going up, but shouldn't have expected any of those organizations who are doing so many other things to have to take the time to orient to themselves to that. So I would go and, and for instance, ask permission to take their information in and to take their names in. And when opportunities came up that we had resources to actually pay them to come and provide information uh, and then also hire prisoners. And so, you know, there's ways like that. And I, I always remember when I was asked to work on, this is a long time ago, when none of it was being set up and they were setting up the, um, you know, trying to figure out what they were gonna do justice wise. I was asked whether I would consider applying for a position to go up to Nunavut. And I said, no, why would you do that? Why would you bring me, a white woman, up to um, to work with Inuit? Uh, why not hire an Inuk woman to do this? And by all means, then, if there's things that we can provide or supports we can, um, you know, then for sure, you, you know, I'd be happy to meet with whoever and share whatever limited knowledge I have, but it, you should not be bringing, and that's exactly what they did. They hired a bunch of white people and guess what? We've got a replication. We've got all the problems that uh, the systemic biases that exist, um, you know, continuing on and then exacerbated. And so I think we do have to, you know, um, when we know we have access to space and resources, as much as possible, get out of the way and make, not just get out of the way, but provide avenues for people to be involved um, in ways that benefit them, not just us. <laughs> so, and in the end, it benefits all of us, but you know, that's that's what I'm still learning and trying to, to keep learning and figure out um, how to improve in those areas. I, I agree completely with what Kim Pate has just said on the educational aspect and uh, it's not just the education of our of ourselves which is uh, which is important because we see ourselves as legislators and uh, which we are but in, in advancing ideas and perhaps this is a teachable moment this pandemic where we are learning that the most vulnerable uh, in certainly in our country and globally are racialized people and uh, we can we can draw something from this uh, my own experience certainly when I was Deputy Minister of International Development and, uh, and beyond, is that we have to look how official development assistance can help on health and on education uh, and generally on social policies. And if this pandemic appears to be doing what it's doing, not just on in terms of health impact, but setting education back one year, two years in, uh, in Africa, for example, and in, in developing countries, then this is an inflection point where the education element becomes very important, not just for uh, policymakers, but for our citizens in our country. We're a wealthy country, so they realize that, yes, we have to look at this and we have to look at it from an intersectional uh, perspective. And I fear that many Canadians do not understand what intersectionality is. I know globally it's not understood. So from this being a teachable moment, we can also become the teachers in terms of advancing the thinking. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, Wanda. Oh, no, go ahead. One of the things that, that occurred to me as I was listening here is that you, you raise the really important issue. Why don't we call it white supremacy? But that's what it is. Uh, and I, I think if you don't call it what it is, you can't fix it. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it, it has occurred to me that if we say, well, white supremacy, who, who are white supremacists? Well, they're the Proud Boys. There's a KKK. I'm not a KKK, so I can't be a white supremacist. So I think that somewhere along the line, we have lost this, or we have taken on good guys, bad guys, uh, and, uh, and and that is actually getting in the way in the way of us uh, acknowledging what the problem we have. Because I'm not like those guys that did this and this, you know. So 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 I can't be racist, even though that's 
racism is the default condition. <laughs> and then there are bad guys too, right? So I, I think that that's been a bit of a problem uh, for us. Um, I really do. I think we've got to take the word back to making sure that we understand what the word means. It's it's easy for us as we look uh, as we look south to always compare ourselves to the U.S. But our history uh, has been full of uh, moments that have been, shall we just say, not very illustrious with respect to racism, and it is systemic. And I think the debate uh, we had as uh, senators on systemic racism and racism uh, at the end of last year was uh, was instructive. I think it was a real moment for the Senate of Canada uh, in terms of putting. Uh, putting issues forward. But I, I agree, it's very easy to say us and, uh, and them. Uh, we are also part of the them and, uh, and we need to see it that way. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, you know, I think we have moments now we can look to the South uh, and, you know, there's lots of comparisons been made between what happened in Washington when Black Lives Matter protests were um, in place, peaceful protests, and then the facilitation of a you know of of a terrorist attack on the on the uh, uh, you know on, on the um, government and is then you know milk toasted down to you know the proud boys or a few extremists no it was facilitated by the very state powers policing and and in that case the president as well and and yet we have our own history. I mean, I remember when um, when Idle No More first started, they were characterized as a terrorist group, an indigenous peaceful that were organizing mostly round dances and collective. Mm -hmm. it, it reminds me of what happened with the Black Panthers in the U.S. as well. They started out doing education and food programs, and the you know the as as movements start to actually uh, gain traction the white supremacist impulse or the racist impulse, however we want to characterize it, um, is to then diminish it by, and worse still, to demonize it. And so I think that whole culture of us, them, and the whole culture of, you know, who is good and who is bad is problematic. And I think we're going to come up, we are coming up to it with C-22, this new bill that the government brought in saying that they're going, they're, it's addressing racism. It's exposing, I think it's exposing the unwillingness to really get at the root of systemic discrimination in our criminal legal system, because if you really want to do that, then we have to look at all of the other places that we have created systemically unequal starting points that result in in um, Indigenous and Black people being uh, more likely to be criminalized, more likely to be uh, in, imprisoned, and more likely to be characterized as the problem, even, you know, even in contexts where we say we want to deal with anti-racism. So I think we have a real opportunity with this bill to put our so-called money where our mouths are and and really demand that if we if we're really saying this is this is the measure the government is taking to respond to the parliamentary black caucus to respond to the black lives matter calls to respond to the defund policing calls then we should really be looking at what can we do with this bill that will actually disrupt the systemic inequality that leads to the overrepresentation, the more likely that certain people get stopped by the police, certain people get prosecuted, and certain people get jailed. And those certain people have happen to be disproportionately racialized and poor. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things as as I was listening to the dialogue, and this this dialogue is so so important. And I think when we when we talk about white supremacy and we think about the racist groups, it's it becomes very easy then for people to say, "Well, that's not me." Yes. You know, I'm I'm fine. Some of my best friends are indigenous. Some of my best friends are black. Some of my best friends are Asian. You know how it goes, right? And so I'm wondering how do we how do we get people who are benefiting every day. From the from race privilege, how do we get them to to see that, to own it, and then to deal with it? Like what are strategies? What are strategies that you used yourselves that helped you move from this place of complacency to really sort of say, you know, I need to own this and and unpack it to 
become an anti-racist advocate and supporter. If I could just quickly jump in. I think having sustained relationships with people who are not white <laughs> is essential. And I, I, I share with you, I ha had no idea how ingrained racist structures were until I got a little brother <laughs> when I was in my 20s who was from of Jamaican origin and I became his big brother in the big brothers thing. And he was eight and he opened my eyes uh, to, to it. I, I, I love him and he's now big old guy. <laughs> and it was, through, it was through seeing the world through his eyes that really made me aware because I hadn't even seen any of that stuff before. I hadn't even seen it. Mm -hmm. I think encouraging uh, the media to do more, and I have noticed, and, and I, I'm hoping, really hoping it's not because it's just Black History Month, but I'm seeing more in the media, the, the story on the, on the weekend of the two uh, young men driving, their driving experiences, for example, being, being pulled over by the police, being, uh, being eyeballed and uh, that, that sort of thing. Uh, important, uh, we should also uh, call out the negative stuff that is on uh, on social media, and there's a lot of that. So we have to somehow try to find a balance, and it goes back to Senator Pate's point about about education being so so vital. So if you, if you can have more and more teaching moments, not uh, you know the heritage minutes that we all uh, appreciated on on television to honor our Black Canadian. Uh, historical figures, for example, but more, look at it, look at it more in a contemporary sense and also in an intersectional uh, sort of way. Uh, and if we can do that and encourage more of that in the media or even in statements that we make as senators, uh, that would be, uh, I think, a step in the right direction. I agree. And although we don't have control over it, I think the more we have uh, diversity within the Senate, the more we see that. And as we call out the aggressions, whether they're bigger or, uh, I mean, I, I don't think there's really such a thing as a microaggression, but, you know, the sorts of things like you have faced, I mean, the number of times um, you, because of you, the color of your skin, me, because I looked like a bag lady half the time, the first week, a few weeks and months we were in the Senate. And how many times did we both get asked for ID? You know, and, and sorry, I'm joking about it it's because I was riding my, anyway, I, I did. I, you know, I came in, I looked like I should be going to somewhere else and not the front door of the Senate and to, to many people. And so then eventually they got used to, oh, she rides her bike and that's why she looks like she's not ready for the Senate. But all joking aside, I do think we need to um, ensure that, you know, the, the Senate is a male, pale, stale institution that we need to regenerate. And um, and that's not my original thought. That's a, a Maori friend of mine characterized her government as that. And I thought, yeah, ours is like that too. So I do think, you know, even the fact that, you know, I, I watch, you know, some of our colleagues who have chil small children and even, you know, my daughter was still in high school. I don't know how people parent from these places, how we make space for, um, you know, all kinds of diversity. But in particular, if we want to be anti-racist, then we also have to acknowledge that we have not done a very good job of ensuring we have uh, people who are not white in the Senate. And so, um, so I think we need to be, you know, wherever we can, um, uh, you know, acknowledging our privilege and wherever possible, um, sharing the resources and the supports and the, the power that that gives us access to that others don't have access to. And using that power and privilege effectively. Exactly. Yes. yes. We are almost out of time, and it's it's so hard to believe that this time has gone so quickly. I want to thank both of you so much for sharing your views and perspectives with us today and, and just being so clear on uh, white privilege, white fragility as being masked for white supremacy. 
Well, thank you for hosting this. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you, Stan and Peter as well, for being such uh, wonderful colleagues. And I look forward to all, all that we're able to achieve as we move forward. Thank you very much. And as I may have said at the beginning, I think we were just getting warmed up here. So there's much more to do. Yes, so. yes. Next week, our topic is uh, on allyship. And so, and next week is our last session for this particular series. But uh, stay, stay tuned because I think we are just starting as well. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. See you all. See you all.